To everyone present here and those joining us online, good evening and welcome to the 39th El Sagobayo Memorial Lecture. Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Affairs, Sandra Maynard, representing our Vice Chancellor, Hilary Beckles. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the interest of the PVC and campus principal, Professor Denzel Williams, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but we are pleased to have your presence, certainly, and the support of both of your offices, as we are pleased to have the support and presence of Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Our guest lecturer, Professor Catherine Hall, Chair for, of the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery, University College London, Professors Monteith, Brian Robertson Satchel, present and past of the Department of History and Archaeology, other professors. I see Prof. Rupert Lewis, Prof. Warner Lewis, Dean Heather Ricketts of the Faculty of Social Sciences, other members of faculty, students, friends, welcome. It is good that we have gathered here for the 39th time to honor Professor Elsa Vesta Govayo and her legacy. It is good that Despite many challenges, the Department of History and, and Archaeology, with the support of the wider university, has been able to, for nearly four decades, honor the legacy of Elsa Govaya. The person and her achievements are certainly worthy of celebration. It is good, as a university recently celebrating 75 years, that we can have these moments where we reflect on who we are and where we are in this continuous process of becoming. Identity, we are reminded, belongs to the future as much as to the past. And it is good for us to recall the work of the people who have built us up as we set our eyes on the next 75 years. Elsa Govaya certainly played a very significant role in where we are as a university, breaking down barriers as a woman professor, as an indigenous professor, a professor from the region, but also very importantly, a professor of the region. She was a pioneer of West Indian history. She was a pioneer of West Indian history as a discipline and as something taught by West Indians, a project essential to ourselves, of selves. At the same time, she endeared herself to those around her. The stories told of her receiving a standing ovation in her very last class. If I were to receive a standing ovation today, I would suspect relief rather than, <laughs> rather than adoration. But this was clearly a remarkable woman. And in Professor Hall, we have another remarkable woman here this evening to help to honor that legacy. The project of building an awareness and understanding of ourselves is, of course, one shared by the wider family of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. And I now invite Dean of that faculty, Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, to bring you greetings. Thank you, Dr. Kresser. I am here in my capacity as Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and normally we hold these lectures in the faculty, and I welcome you to the faculty, but not this time. Okay, so very happy to be here at regional headquarters, PVC Global, Sandra Maynard, Dean Ricketts, retired professors, both of the Department of History and Archaeology and other departments in the faculty, current professors, retired, um, colleagues, current colleagues, students, um, it is uh, with great uh, gladness that I'm here. Um, and while I'm probably one of the longest serving staff members in the audience today, uh, still on staff, uh, having received my 30 year long service award a few years ago, this tradition predates my arrival. I found it here when I started working here in 1991, and I remember the excitement around the annual event. It was one of the biggest events in the faculty. Um, it is therefore a long tradition. It's probably safe safer for me not to try and recall any names of people who delivered the lecture because I'll probably misremember them, but distinguished speakers have hailed both from within the region and outside the region. Topics, of course, revolve around Caribbean history, but my recollection of the topics is that they have been very diverse. 
that they uh, pertain primarily to colonial and post-colonial history, but then within that, um, I recall lectures ranging over the colonial impacts on indigenous peoples, lectures on plantation society, but also maronage and rebellion, uh, lectures on post-slavery institutions such as law and education and so on. Geographically, lectures have pertained both to West Indian history, but also to, for instance, Cuban um, history, Santo Domingo. Um, so today's lecture is part of a cherished tradition. And its subject matter is befitting for a lecture named in honor of Elsa Govaya's legacy. And Dr. Kresser said it very well when he said that this is both about uh, the future and the past. The subject matter is, of course, very relevant in an age of an increasingly loud call, in fact, a clamor for serious debate about reparations. So, Professor Hall, it is my honor to welcome you on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Thank you, Dean. Elsa Govaya sadly passed away in 1980 at the age of 54, which means many of us only know her through her work. The video you are about to watch is meant to help you to get her, to know her a little bit more closely through the memories and reflections of her former colleagues, as well as, very importantly, through her own voice. When I was at college as an undergraduate student, that is at University College London, I did English history, not West Indian history. And it was not until I became a postgraduate student working for my doctorate that I began to do West Indian history. The name Elsa Gavaya had become a legend before she arrived in England in 1945. Most Guyanese mentioned her name with reverence and indeed awe, as she was the first woman to have broken the tradition by winning the one territorial scholarship in Guyana. That scholarship took her to University College London. And there, in her final year, she topped the class, won the Pollard Prize for English History, the prestigious prize that was awarded to the best history scholar at University College London. It was a feat which made the senior professor at UCL write to the director of colonial scholars and describe her as remarkable. An unmistakable feature of Elsa Gavaya's career is that she was the first person to teach a flagship course in West Indian history at this university. This was what she was recruited to do. Elsa Gavaya and this very special second year course in West Indian history became inseparable for three decades. I do the teaching in West Indian history, which is my special interest, and I also do the teaching in the history of Latin America. In addition to this, uh, I do research in West Indian history, which is the subject that most particularly concerns me. Elsa Govaya is foundational to this faculty. So foundational is she that even before she was so appointed, her appointment was called for, not by name, but by post, in the Urban Commission which set up this university. The Urban Commission's report includes a specific reference to the need for a lecturer in Caribbean history when the university began to ensure the issue of Caribbean identity. And Elsa Govaya was the first such appointee. Is the place for me. London, 
Now, you plan to go to England soon, I gather. Um, what exactly are you going to undertake this time? At this time, I'm hoping to do some work in the public record office, where, as I say, it's possible to find a great deal of material in a relatively short time. And there, the main object of my search is going to be to find the British West Indian slave laws. I'm particularly interested in British West Indian history during the 18th century, which is, of course, the great period of slavery, and I'm working on the slave laws, and this is one of the things that I should be doing in London during this summer. You can go to France or America, India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. I wrote the historiography of the British West Indies as part of a series of historiographies dealing with the Americas. The object of this book was to discuss the work of historians of the British West Indies and to try to evaluate the work that they'd written. The author, for all her scholarly detachment, writes with an earnestness born of wide knowledge and deep sympathy, which relatively few West Indian historians have previously achieved. She writes in a clear, lucid, unaffected style, which is a pleasure to read. In general, Miss Kavaya's criticisms are well-informed, penetrating and scrupulously fair. With her own wide knowledge of the West Indian past, she is able not only to describe what the author said, but also to explain why they said it. Well, my impressions of federal development, I should say, are those of a, an individual who is very much in favor of a closer union of the West Indies, so that to some extent, perhaps I may be regarded as biased. But I regard myself as a West Indian and that I should like to see the Federation succeed. Elsa Kapai was able to use West Indian history as a social science tool to explain to campus audiences the historical foundations of our modern West Indian dilemmas. She put history at the center of the enterprise of making us West Indians. For 30 years with her other colleagues, they ensured that the region came to understand for the first time, really, that they had a history. They were more than an appendage of the British Empire, but had something with its own internal dynamic. And in that regard, their graduates, people they taught, the teachers who left here in the 50s and 60s, returned throughout the Caribbean, not consciously doing it, but even evangelizing and building Caribbean identity. And crucial to that would have been the work of Elsa Govaya. We honor her first as a scholar. We honor her also as an inspiring teacher. And we remember her as our mentor an exemplar. We honor her because she pioneered and established West Indian history as an academic discipline. And finally, we remember her for the person that she was. For Elsa Gavaya. And here we are remembering the dark woman who searched out meaning in the dust and left us the enigma of her going. I find contact with young students whose minds are open to new ideas, a very stimulating experience indeed, and even though it is also exhausting, I don't think I should like to do without it.
And now that we have gotten to know our honorary a little better, it is time to do the same for our guest lecturer. To help us to do just that, I now invite Professor Kathleen Monteith from the Department of History and Archaeology. Thank you very much, Dr. Cressa. Catherine Hall is Emerita Professor of Modern British Social and Cultural History. She began her academic career at the University of Sussex at Farmer before transferring to the University of Birmingham, where she gained a first class honors degree in British medieval and modern history. Later, she attained a master's in social history at the University of Essex and then a doctorate at the University of East London in 1993. All this occurred between getting married and having and raising two children with husband, the renowned Jamaican-born British cultural theorist and activist Stuart Hall. Born to parents described as labor radical, Catherine herself would early on become an activist. In the early 1960s, she protested for nuclear disarmament in the UK and across Europe. She was also involved in the women's movement in Britain, attending in 1970 the UK's first National Women's Liberation Conference at Rushkin College, Oxford, and joined the Feminist Review Collective between 1981 and 1997. Her activism continued to be exemplified in her rejection in 2016 of the Dan David Prize which included a 225,000 pound research fund from the Dan David Foundation in Tel Aviv, Israel. Her rejection of the prize was in support of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which models itself off the anti-apartheid movement of South Africa, and which promotes boycotts, divestments, and economic sanctions against Israel because of its occupation of Palestinian land and inhumane and unjust policies towards Palestinian people in the West Bank. In rejecting the award, Hall stated that it was an independent political choice to do so. It is therefore no surprise that Hall's academic work reflects her activism. Establishing herself in the early years of her career as a feminist historian, delving into issues of gender, class, race, and empire in her work, which covers the period 1700 to 1900. Hall was employed as a senior research officer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Essex between 1978 and 1982, and as a gender historian in the Department of Cultural Studies at the Northeast London Polytechnic, now the University of East London, between 1983 and 1993. She returned to the University of Essex as professor in the Department of Sociology for the period 1993 to 1998, before moving to the University College of London as professor of modern British social and cultural history, where she remained until her retirement in 2016. With the support of a number of research grants and fellowships over the years, Catherine Hall has established a prolific and impactful publication record many of which she has received prizes for. Among them are Family Fortunes, Men and Women of English Middle Class, 1780 to 1850, published in 1987 with a new edition in 2002. White, Male and Middle Class, Explorations in Feminism and History, published in 1992, Defining the Victorian Nation, Class, Race, Gender, and the British Reform Act of 1867, published in 2000. Civilizing Subjects, Metropole and Colony in the English Imagination, 1830 to 1867, published in 2002. Macaulay and Son, Architects of Imperial Britain, published in 2012. And with Nicholas Draper, Keith McClelland, Rachel Lang, and Katie Donington, Legacies of British Slave Ownership, Colonial Slavery, and the Formation of Victorian, Victorian England, published in 2014. Her most recent book, Lucky Valley, Edward Long and the History of Racial Capitalism, published in February this year, has already received much acclaim. 
and I will quote the endorsement by Jennifer L. Morgan, professor of history at New York University. <clears throat> Catherine Hall's study of Edward Long's life and influence is indispensable. While the work is a careful, detailed examination of Long and his family, it is much more than a biography. Hall situates Long as a crucial architect of racial capitalism and clarifies the importance of his role in crafting a worldview in which slavery and slave ownership were at the very center of modernity and empire. Hall's brilliance as a scholar of history race and gender is well established, and the structure and significance of British Caribbean slave ownership. Scholars and the general public all over the world and the Caribbean are able to have immediate access to information that aids in furthering biographical and family history, landscape and community history, business, economic, and political history. Indeed, the database has also assisted research for the reparations for slavery movement here in the Caribbean and has caused British nationals, upon learning their family connections with slavery in the region, to make restitution. In recognition of her outstanding contribution to history, Professor Hall has been honored several times, the latest being in 2021 with the award of the prestigious British Academy and Leverhulme um, Trust Medal. On that note, please welcome Professor Catherine Hall to deliver the 39th annual Elsa Gavaya Memorial Lecture at the University of the West Indies. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction, which of course leaves me feeling a little bit kind of, well, I hope I can I hope I can match what you've heard in uh, what I have to say now. It was such a pleasure to see um, the video about Elsa Gavaya. Um, I found that very affecting, so pleased that you had it. And it actually, um, I have to quickly rethink some of the things that I've said so that I don't repeat um, what you've already heard this evening. Well, I'm so pleased to be here and I would like to thank Dr. Kressa and the History Department for the invitation to give this annual lecture named for Elsa Gavaya, which has been delivered by so many distinguished historians over the years. It's an especial honor to be here as a white British historian and one who has tried in my work to explore the long and difficult history of power and inequality between Britain and Jamaica. The entanglements, though that's such a weak word, which doesn't do, that have shaped the histories of both islands in different ways. My engagement with this beautiful island and its troubled past began with my marriage to a Jamaican, Stuart Hall, who first brought me here in 1965. I treasure the long connection. My talk tonight is a sort of report on how I see the situation in the UK now in relation to this troubled history. So when Julian did the introduction, he talked about the importance of these lectures and in relation to the explorations of yourselves and your country and your history. Well, what's wrong? <laughs> Am I too close to it? Hello? Hello? Is that better? So it's very much about us in the UK and what's going on there in relation to you. I know that your view from Jamaica will be very different and I look forward to hearing more about it. I was going to say, as many of you may not realize, but now I know you all know, that Gavaya honed her skills as a historian at UCL, my institution, in the early 1940s a connection of which we're very proud and have indeed instituted our own annual lecture in her name. Gavar came to UCL as an undergraduate, having received a Guyanese scholarship 
excelled in her degree, went on to complete her PhD just three years after Eric Williams had published Capitalism and Slavery. That kind of situates where the work stands. Unfortunately, there is no record of what her experience at UCL was like. It can hardly have been easy, although there's plenty of um, good comment on her brilliant work, but what it was like for a woman of color in a very white, very male department, I cannot quite imagine. The thesis done, as you know, she joined the University of College of the West Indies and became one of the most influential historians of that remarkable generation who together created a new Caribbean historiography committed to the investigation of how racial slavery worked across whole societies and what traces it left on the contemporary. I feel I owe a particular debt to Gavaya since she had a keen understanding of the significance of Edward Long, the subject of my new book, Lucky Valley, Edward Long and the History of Racial Capitalism. Can we have my lovely cover on the... Long's History of Jamaica, Gavaya wrote, possesses distinction as historical literature, brilliance as polemical writing, and unsurpassed importance as one of the most interesting social documents left to posterity by any single historian of the British West Indies. She grasped that Long's image of the African was distorted by fear that he masked his own uncertainties about natural inequality by assertion, and that his work shed a glaring light, as she put it, upon the influence of slavery as it affected both slaveholder and slave. Eric Williams, in contrast, denounced Long as narrow, parochial, and bound by his prejudices. None of the defenders of slavery have any merit or international significance today, he proclaimed, a judgment for which Gavaya critiqued him. Unfortunately, Williams was wrong. Long's defense of racial difference as natural has lived on into the present, a key legacy from slavery. He articulated in print what was already lived that white, with a capital W, as he wrote it, and Negro, with a capital N, were fundamentally unequal, that the one existed in relation to the other, and that white men were born to rule. Peter Fryer, the first historian of black people in Britain, consequently named him the father of English racism. As a white English historian, I turn to Edward Long to point to the significance of history writing in the legitimations of racism and slavery and to call him to account in the present. Long's three-volume History of Jamaica, published in 1774, never out of print, has been utilized by innumerable scholars and historians but has not been systematically addressed from an anti-imperial and post-colonial standpoint. Much recent scholarship from the Caribbean and the US has focused with good reason on the lives of the enslaved, those whose voices have been lost and silenced in the official archives. For the descendants of the enslaved, this is a priority and new histories from the Caribbean and the US, as for example, that of Tia Miles, All That She Carried, have demonstrated innovative ways of recovering some of what has been lost. For those of us in Britain who have been and continue to be the beneficiaries of colonial exploitation and extraction, whose lives have been enriched by the wealth which has flowed to the UK whether from the Caribbean, India, or Africa, there is a different responsibility. We need to rethink imperial histories 
challenge the denials and disavowals which have characterized the ways in which empire has been narrated. Unpick those works which legitimate racisms or celebrate Britain's so-called gift of liberty to others and erase and occlude the wealth and power derived from slavery and colonialism. Our rethinking now needs to be situated in the context of a long history of struggles over slavery, race, and empire, which have erupted in Britain, particularly at times of crisis, and have had lasting effects on metropolitan life. Slavery was contested from the beginnings by Quakers and from the 1770s by abolitionists, moderates, radicals, and feminists fears as to the corrupting effects of empire on the metropole fueled debates throughout the late 18th and 19th centuries. Liberals and critics of empire were outraged by Eyre's brutal response to the events in Morant Bay and attempted unsuccessfully to force a reckoning in Britain. Arguments over race have a long history at home and that has, that has gradually been uncovered in the last decades. Now, I want to argue, we are in a, a new moment, a new conjuncture in Gramsci's terminology, a time when different social, political, economic, and ideological contradictions come together to give it a specific and distinctive shape, a moment in which we are compelled to think and act. This new conjuncture is in the wake of decolonization, Brexit, and Black Lives Matter. Britain has woken up to its ugly history, particularly in relation to slavery. There is no longer an accepted common sense as to Britain's imperial past. It's become a contested field politically and culturally. The question of reparations once dismissed as marginal, has been mainstreamed. The Church of England's own commission, commission investigating its history in relation to enslavement has last week argued for a fund of a billion pounds, immediately challenged by black people as inadequate. At this time, in this new moment, writing new histories tracking the traces and legacies of empire into the now can provide the evidence and the tools for people to think with and ponder questions of responsibilities that need to be faced if any reparative future is to be not only imagined but effected. As the celebrated South African lawyer and activist Albie Sachs has put it, we cannot rewind history but we can recast the historical narrative. Active acknowledgement of an unjust past is one step in developing a reparatory politics. My title this evening is Unsettling Accounts, Britain's Troubled Relation with Slavery and Empire. It's a troubled relation that has persisted through emancipation, colonialism, and neocolonialism and is still all too present in the contemporary UK. We are talking about a past that lives on in the present, a past that is not over. The scandalous treatment of the Windrush generation and the continuing deportation of Jamaicans, many of whom have lived virtually all their lives in England, is only the most powerful indicator of the continuing trouble. New migrants were invited to come to, I don't think he's looking. Is anybody looking? At, okay. Were invited to come to England in post-war Britain to provide the labor which would help to build a better society and welfare state. The promise was of a good new life in the so-called mother country, beautifully captured in this iconic photograph of arrivals, which actually hangs in our house in our hall, in our house in London. It's a, just a great photograph. The breaking of those hopes over decades 
culminated in the disgrace of the Windrush scandal. Other continuing signs of trouble are the evidence of his systemic racism in major British institutions, especially the police then. What accounts then do I hope to unsettle? And how might we think about current understandings of the long and painful history between the two islands? You will be very familiar here with the demands for reparation from the erstwhile European empires made by CARICOM and the work that has been going on across the Caribbean, not least by your Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, and the Center for Reparation Research, led by Professor Vereen Shepherd here at UWE. There are vital questions for Jamaica about past and present, but what is the situation in the UK? How widespread is the recognition of wrongs done that have not been put right? And how powerful is the pushback against this? Britain's history in Jamaica is what in the heritage industry is described as difficult, something of an understatement. Catalogues of wrongs which have not been righted is closer to the truth. Four moments have cast long shadows in Britain and capture aspects of Britain's responsibilities. Why there is a debt to pay. 1655 was the starting point, Cromwell's expedition, the English claim for Jamaica and the creation of a colony built on slavery. 1833 marked emancipation. 1865 was the uprising at Morant Bay. 2018, the Windrush scandal. Each of these moments carries a story of race, power, exploitation, and inequality. But each episode had all its own specificities, its own distinctive racialized relations. It's then and now. My four key moments will be very familiar to you, but it is vital to tell these stories in Britain. In the late 17th and 18th century, colonists worked to make a slave society replete with hierarchies of race and gender, one designed to exploit the labor of captive African men and women in the interests of extracting maximum profits for the mother country. They relied on violence and coercion to obtain labor, make people into commodities, applying the rules of commerce, the market and property to men, women and children, defining blackness as difference and inequality. The enslaved cleared land, established plantations, grew cane, built works to harvest it, roads to transport it to harbors ready to send it to London or Bristol for refinement. The colonists claimed the profit. White men depended on the crown to provide military and naval support in the face of internal and external enemies. They extracted promises of freedom for themselves and the freedom to enslave others. In return, the duties they paid on their sugar and the taxes they raised on the island provided a major source of revenue for metropolitan governments facilitating imperial dreams of warfare and expansion. A mercantilist system of trade privileged colonial products and British shipping. Colonists regarded captives as, quote, superfluous to West Africa, enslaved labor as disposable, less than fully human, and condemned men and women to a form of social death their roots to kin, rituals, habits, cultures, and places destroyed. Denied the ability to form and keep families, their children claimed by their owners, slavery replaced the essential bonds of kinship with capital. Possibilities of building new lives and communities were constantly impeded. This was indeed a catastrophic history and one that has shaped the lives of, ge of generations. Jamaica was perhaps the most unequal place on the planet, as Orlando Patterson writes in his introduction to his new edition 
of his classic texts. Slavery, he writes, was drenched in violence, rape an integral part, and tragically, the violence of the enslaver against the enslaved poisoned the relations of all. Slavery, as David Scott has described it in his just published Irreparable Evil, institutionalized a transgenerational structure of dominance. It has done irreparable harm across centuries, both bodily and psychic, its legacies living on into the present. 1833, emancipation, long fought for, did not make people free. I'm sorry, there are so many people in the audience who will know all of this bit of what I'm talking about, but hopefully there are those who don't absolutely know at all, but it has to be told in Britain. The enslaved were no longer held as property, but consigned to apprenticeship and its aftermath to decades of poverty, limited economic and political rights. The plantation economy was regarded as sacrosanct in Britain and defended against all, intent, all attempts to improve the condition of the peasantry. The frustrations of the poor and the landless erupted in 1865 in Morant Bay. Governor Eyre's brutal and lawless overreaction was condemned by some in Britain, but they failed to hold him to account. Jamaica became a crown colony, its representative assembly abolished, black Jamaicans virtually eliminated as a political force, the interests of the plantations were to remain paramount. When anger once er again erupted in 1838 with demands over wages and conditions of work from both workers and peasants, the response of the Moyne Commission with its white British membership was cautious and limited. Political sovereignty had to be granted, but federation which would have reduced British power in the region was undermined to the dismay of Norman Manley and the fury of Eric Williams. Williams had understood from the 1940s, as he explicated in his classic text, Capitalism and Slavery, that colonization was about the creation of wealth and power for Britain at the expense of the colonized, abolition about new modes of capitalist development dependent on waged and so-called free labor. The shift from mercantile to industrial capitalism meant chattel slavery was outmoded. Williams believed that the debt that the history meant a debt was owed by Britain and what he called a golden handshake, a significant capital grant would provide some proper recompense. The British authorities, however, preferred weak, independent nations to a unified region and offered only a mean sum, continuing to blame those they had colonized for what they called homegrown problems, inefficiency and incompetence. These were the 20th century versions of those discourses of African idleness and lack of industry, the necessity for white control and coercion, so central to racists from Edward Long in the late 18th century to Thomas Carlyle in the mid 19th century and James Anthony Froude at the end of the century. And then the Windrush scandal. Thousands of British people were wrongly classified as illegal immigrants, many deported or imprisoned, summarily sacked, their homes repossessed, cancer patients denied treatment. The government spoke with two voices, actively creating a hostile environment on the one hand, while claiming to be an inclusive nation on the other. Many Windrush victims still await compensation, struggling with the complexity of the appeal system and the lack of legal aid. They continue to fight for justice, but at least 44 persons have died having submitted their claims but received nothing. The poor understanding of colonial history in the Home Office and the public at large played a part in this, as did the government's policy of creating a hostile environment. 
Windrush, Windrush descendants were not understood as British. They were black and from the Caribbean. Yet they had been British subjects from the time of emancipation. David Lammy, the current Shadow Foreign Secretary, spoke directly and eloquently to this history in the House of Commons. My ancestors, he said, were British subjects, but they were not British subjects because they came to Britain. They were British subjects because Britain came to them, took them across the Atlantic, colonized them, sold them into slavery, profited from their labor, and made them British subjects, and then denied them their rights. There is then a debt, a very different kind of debt from that which the IMF and the World Bank imposed on Jamaica with its dire consequences. The United Kingdom's historic debt is a moral and political one, but who is responsible for it? Is it the state? This is a possibility which is always denied in Britain. No government has offered an apology or any acknowledgement for slavery, only regrets that the slave trade was legal at the time. As our current Prime Minister Sunak recently put it in the House of Commons, trying to unpick our history is not the right way forward. Reparations have been paid to the survivors of the Mau Mau atrocities in Kenya, but only after much research and the discovery of hidden colonial archives documenting the ill treatment and torture of prisoners, some of whom were still alive. David Cameron, as you will know well, offered an insult to Jamaica, a new prison. CARICOM continues to lobby for meaningful negotiations with the relevant European states on the basis of legal claims, but the omens, certainly in Britain, are not hopeful. So if not the state, is it then the nation that is responsible? Both Granville Sharp and Wilberforce in the late 18th and early 19th century used this language. Slavery was a national sin and there must be atonement. They were part of the effort to mobilize an abolitionist public, which alongside the Baptist War in Jamaica and shifts in the organization of capital, forced governmental action. But then is it the institutions that profited, the banks, insurance companies, all the other corporate bodies? Lloyds of London, for example, have made it clear that their efforts, that their reparatory efforts are limited to their own practices in relation to recruitment, employment, and promotion? Is it up to the individuals whose families are known to have benefited, the descendants of slave owners? A few have made some acknowledgement and offered donations. A group of descendants have constituted themselves as the heirs of slavery called on the government to apologize and vowed to lobby for, for forms of reparative justice. Their efforts in the Caribbean have been let, met with little enthusiasm. Alex Renton, whose ancestors owned property in Tobago and the Roselle Plantation in Jamaica, has written his family story and documented his own attempts to come to terms with a blood-stained history. As one of his interviewees remarked to him, what I'm interested in is how you, your family, are going to heal yourselves. That is what is needed for the white people to work out what they are going to do and be for the future. So what hopes then of reparation? How might the white people in Britain work out what we are going to do and be for the future. This, I suggest, is the moment we are now in. The white population of England and Wales is now approximately 82% of the population. We, white people, are not personally culpable 
for what happened centuries ago, we, the white people, those of us alive now, did not engage in the slavery business, but by virtue of belonging to a society that has historically benefited to such a degree, we do, I would argue, carry responsibility. We're not guilty of a crime. We are neither the victims nor the perpetrators of the evil of slavery, but we are beneficiaries of what was done and carries on being done as members of a society enriched by that system. Britain was able to develop as a modern industrial society in part because of the wealth and practices of racialization transmitted from the Caribbean. The slavery business nurtured Britain's manufacturing and service sectors and enabled the promotion of the human and financial capital necessary for new levels of growth. Slavery ended, but unfree racialized labor, particularly in the form of indenture, continued across many sites from the Caribbean to Mauritius and Fiji. White workers at home enjoyed a relatively high standard of living enabled by those who were colonized. Post-war Britain had a welfare state and a national health service which despite all the depredations which have taken place since the 1980s and which cause us to despair now, still mark a vast gap between, between conditions of life here and in the Caribbean. No evil can be truly passed, as the cultural critic Bruce Robbins writes, as long as its beneficiaries continue to profit from it, enjoying an unearned benefit. We, I'm, constant, I'm using we as we, the white people of Britain, in the contemporary UK are implicated in events which are spatially and temporally different. This is a distant. This is the price we pay for living in a society. We've inherited benefits from regimes of domination which we neither originated or control for we inhabit societies of power and privilege and belong to a collectivity which has accumulated wealth over centuries in part by the exploitation of colonized people. What is more, until there is a significant change, we contribute, whether we like it or not, to the persistence of these long established patterns of inequality, reproducing the everyday conditions of possibility for systemic racisms and new configurations of neoliberal capitalism. We need to ask what exactly is meant by implication? Who does it include? Is everyone implicated in the same way? Surely not. Isn't there a difference between the rich and the poor? Who is responsible? Who is to judge? And what does responsibility mean? Is it a moral responsibility? Is it a responsibility to act? If so, in what ways? These are all questions. These are the questions for now. Both as a citizen and as a historian, I would say I do have a responsibility to try and uncover the truths of the past, truths which have still not been addressed and the legacies of which run deep into the present. The notion of a debt to pay is not new. Otaba Kugano, born in what is now Ghana, but captured by slaver when he was slavers when he was 13, ended up in London in the 1770s. And he may have been the first African to publish a claim in England in his thoughts and sentiments on the slave trade for redress for slavery, a system which he believed was against humanity. Equiano followed him, his narrative acting as a wake-up call for abolitionists across the country. The Jamaican Robert Wedderburn's writings were a call to action against the horrors of slavery. These three men sought social and racial justice. 
white abolitionists interpreted these claims in terms of the ending of the slave trade and the winning of abolition, but something much more was at issue. Claims for redress were reiterated in 1865, and it is these demands for social and racial justice in the face of continued exploitation, which have now come to the fore in the recent past in Britain and are now provoking strong resistance. The bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade in 2007 marked a new public conversation in Britain about slavery. Why were we celebrating abolition rather than thinking about the centuries of slavery? Why was William Wilberforce remembered rather than the unnamed Africans who had resisted? The presence in the United Kingdom at that time of a second generation, the children of the Windrush, made for a new politics. This diasporic population defined themselves as black, asked whether they could possibly be British, and rejected parental anxieties as to making claims on the host society, which had demanded their labor, but offered scant reward. They denounced British racism and demanded the full rights of citizenship. They wanted to understand the impact of empire and colonialism and to explore new histories. This provided the context for the development of our project at UCL and the LBS database which we created, which Kathleen Monteith very kindly talked about. The British orthodoxy was that race and slavery happened in the Caribbean and in the US and not in Britain. We aim to unpick this and the common sense understanding that abolition was effected by white humanitarians and had nothing to do with economic power. We used the fact that when slavery was abolished, slave owners received compensation to the tune of 20 million to explore who they were. We focused particularly in our biographical work on the Britons who benefited. Our intention was to bring slavery home. Identifying the individuals who received compensation and what they did with the money challenged the distancing, the disavowal of British involvement. We documented the activity of numerous individuals, including not just the well-known names such as the Gladstones, but many widows and single women who inherited through their fathers and husbands and were living off the ill-gotten gains of their families. Compensation was used to invest in railways, merchant banks, insurance, and urban property, contributing to the emergence of Britain as the dominant global power in the 19th century. Houses were built, books and artworks bought, enabling slave owners and merchants to buy a place in polite society. The slave owners took their human and financial capital to the new colonies of white settlement Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, facilitating the further expansion of white power. They actively defended the political and economic interests of the planters over the next decades, arguing for indenture so that they could bring in new South Asian labor, which would lessen their depend dependence on the emancipated. They claimed to support emancipation, but worked hard in their writings to reconfigure racial inequality, for when slavery was no longer there to secure it, how might be secured? Our findings are all available on the database with just a click of your mouse. It is a public resource financed with public money, free, very easy to use, and continues to benefit from additional information from over a thousand members of the public. First published in 20, 2014, our database has had a significant impact. By now, we have had well over three million hits. Initially, it was individuals who were the primary users, people looking for their ancestors, searching for those family histories that were denied, discovering their connections, sometimes expected, 
many times not, to the families legitimate and outside of white slavery. And curators were soon accessing it. In the last few years, attitudes have begun to change, and Britain's involvement in slavery has become more widely recognized. The killing of George Floyd in 2020 and the scale of the response mobilized around Black Lives Matter has shifted the parameters of the debates once again. We are, as I have said, in a new moment. The drama of the seizure of the slave trader Edward Colston's statue in Bristol, a statue which had been the subject of controversy for many years, and its dumping into the docks where slave ships had once been moored was an incisive moment. Statues have a weight and solidity. It was very heavy, the Colston statue. They stand on plinths. They look down on us. They conserve the past in the present, tell us what we should remember and what we should forget. The majority of the innumerable statues of white men were commissioned in the late 19th century and early 20th century, times when British dominance was being challenged by rival imperial powers and anti-colonial movements. They could act as a continual reminder that white Britons could imagine themselves as both a race of masters and a master race. Now, however, there is a reckoning. Towns and cities, universities, museums, galleries, and major national institutions have had to face up to the demands of their staff and their publics as to their historic involvement in slavery. Knowledge about a history it is recognized is a necessary first step in tackling its long-term legacies. Researchers have been using the database alongside other records to explore the links that institutions have to slavery. Universities such as Glasgow and Bristol, Oxford and Cambridge colleges, the National Portrait Gallery, the Fitzwilliam Museum, the Bank of England, the Church of England, the Guardian newspaper, even Lloyd's of London are publishing their research findings, demonstrating the wealth that those institutions derived from their donors or stakeholders and suggesting forms of reparation. Galleries and museums reflect on how artists have represented race and empire. The Royal Academy's new show, Entangled Pasts, aims to explore the ways in which British art has been implicated in and responded to histories of enslavement and empire. Paintings by past masters, such as Reynolds, Benjamin West, and Turner, are exhibited in dialogue with the works of contemporary artists, Frank Bowling, Hugh Locke, John Acomfra, and Lubena Hamid, inviting the viewer to think about how art signifies its time, both then and now. As Hugh Locke comments in relation to his glorious armada of boats of every kind, suspended in a room alongside classic paintings of naval power and men in peril on the sea, we're always sailing alongside the ghosts of the past. Bowling's powerful and evocative middle passage reminds us that traces of memories and of bodies refuse to disappear. They resurface again and again to trouble us. These efforts to rethink its, the past in its complexity have involved significant new research, engaged historians, archivists, curators and writers, and opened up questions for multiple audiences. Institutions and individuals have engaged in self-reflection, tried to think about the past in the present. New possibilities emerge, new platforms, new proposals as to how to engage with local communities and address wrongs. Glasgow University has partnered with UWE in a postgraduate degree in reparatory justice. 
The Guardian has invested significant capital in a journey towards repairing the harms of the past. It is very difficult to assess what the longer term practical effects of all this will be, how changes will last. Will a greater knowledge of the past facilitate a better understanding of contemporary racism and the patterns of inequality with their deep roots in the legacies of slavery and colonialism? Have the connections been made between past and present? Has the research that has been done confronted structures, the intersection of economic and political forces, the institutional racism that is so present? Increasing, and the favored term now is diversity, in the workforce is often seen as a key objective, but increased black and brown representation has no necessarily necessary relation to tackling racism. Look at our current, our contemporary cabinet, if you want examples of why that is not the case. A focus on what happened then, who did what then, who benefited then, needs to be established and articulated with people's experience now with the disappointments of the attainment gap amongst minority student populations, or why infant mortality rates for black and brown babies are so, so high. Proposals have been made, money promised but not yet raised, centers suggested but not established, commitments made about recruitment and systems of promotion but not yet tested, Syllabuses challenged but not transformed. And all this is happening in the context of a sustained governmental attack on the human, humanities and critical thinking, while local councils have been instructed from central government to end support for equality and diversity initiatives. There is a reaction then strongly supported by far-right elements in the Conservative Party. They see themselves as engaged in struggle. The scale of the reaction clarifies the extent to which re-examining the past is seen by some as a subversive and dangerous activity threatening British values. Take the case of the National Trust a great and much-loved national institution with more than five and a half million individual members. The National Trust has become the site of a culture war, a battle over the common sense of slavery and empire, a proxy for the political struggles over Brexit and Britain's future. The speed of change in the last decades has bred fears and anxieties as to the disappearance of old ways, longings to hold on to what is familiar. Will this country be a sovereign white island, self-sufficient, with defended borders excluding unwanted migrants, and a glorious history of standing alone? Isn't the empire something to be proud of? It established laws, built railways, promoted democracy to benighted others? Or will it be a country that recognizes it's just a small island, knows the dark side of its history, welcomes cosmopolitanism, understands our dependence on others, and wants to live with ethnic and racial difference? The National Trust owns more than 500 historic properties, willed to them in exchange for freedom from death duties. Country estates are emblematic of England's landed and aristocratic heritage, seen by some as the last vestiges of a world that is disappearing. Visiting a National Trust property has become a qu quintessential day out for many people a stately home, a garden, perhaps a walk across beautiful countryside, a shop with tasteful commodities, and a cafe. Always scones and cream. <laughs> the home and family stood in for the country and the nation, explains Katie Donington, a sanitized microcosm of the social, cultural, 
economic and political relations of a deeply hierarchical society structured through class, gender, and race. A white space evoking the English love of domesticity, countryside, continuity, and tradition, and representing a history that is rooted, local, and unchanging. The Trust relies heavily on older white middle-class volunteers, predominantly women, to act as guides, servers, and shop assistants. Concerned as to the lack of, the, of diversity in their visitors as the uh, population changes, both in terms of class and ethnic belonging, the Trust first explored the place of servants. Meanwhile, evidence was building up of the links between slavery and the country house. My colleague, Nick Draper, estimated in 2009 that in the 1830s, between 5 and 10% of country houses were occupied by slave owners. The government organization, English Heritage, organized a conference and a book on slavery and the British country house. And following a successful schools project hosted by the Trust in 2018 on the colonial countryside, a decision was made to explore links to slavery and empire in their properties, making extensive use of our database. A preliminary report was published in 2020 at a time when Black Lives Matter was garnering much attention, with details on 93 estates 48 of which had either direct or indirect links to slavery. One of the Trust's most spectacular properties is Penryn Castle, which stands on the cliffs overlooking the Menai Straits, separating Wales from the island of Anglesey. A monumental edifice in neo-Norman style, complete with towers, turrets, a walled garden, and acres of parkland. Its construction was facilitated by the compensation, 15,000 pounds for 764 enslaved men and women in Jamaica, received by Dawkins Pennant. An active pro-slaver, he had inherited the property from his cousin, Richard Pennant, a vigorous defender of the slave trade, who owned four estates in Clarendon. The National Trust report provoked rage and fury. Slavery was past, insisted the critics. Its legacies have no place in our present. There were hostile reports in the right-wing national press, the Spectator, the Daily Mail, and the Telegraph. The key author of the report was harassed Fears were voiced that the National Trust had been taken over by divisive Black Lives Matter supporters. Britain, was, it was claimed, was under attack, its national pride being under, undermined. The spectre of an anti-racist mission to destroy the nation was evoked. Statues would be defended. Churchill's was surrounded by right-wing supporters in case of attack. They constructed a whole defensive guard around Churchill's. Noisy activists must be silenced. The issue was raised in the House of Commons and the then Conservative Cultural Se Culture Secretary, Olive Oliver Dowden, called a meeting of 25 heritage organisations and instructed them that history should not automatically start from a position of guilt and shame or denigration of the nation's past. Attempts were made to replace council members on the trust with others unsymp unsympathetic to such investigations. This was unsuccessful, but significant damage had been done. New research was abandoned, and the trust noted that in the aftermath of what they now came to call their special investigation, they would be returning to their core work. Troubled by the tide of critical reflection on slavery and empire, and seeing the activities of Black Lives Matter as particularly disturbing, a group of conservative historians organized themselves as the History Reclaimed Project to publish material 
agitate and lo lobby government on the teaching in schools and universities. Reparatory History, a recent article on this site claims, is equating good history with contemporary social justice, abandoning the time-honored work of historians to investigate and assess in favor of bowing to activists and using history as a tool for promotion. A second organization, the Restore Trust, was convened to focus on questions of heritage while the Common Sense Group in the House of Commons provides a powerful collection of allies for the culture warriors with the ears of the current government. The shared objectives of these organizations is to challenge and silence, when possible, what are construed as attacks on Britain's history and values. New investigations and reports have been closely monitored, institutions pressured, individuals harried, harried. Oxbridge colleges have been in the firing line. Many have done their own research to establish the extent of connections with the past. Not surprisingly, given the age of these co colleges, most uncovered donations and bequests associated with slave owners and their descendants. Investigations at Jesus College Cambridge, for example, into the college's links with slavery, discovered that one of their original 17th century donors, Tobias Rustat, from whom they had benefited very substantially, was a director of the Royal African Company and owned many shares in the South Sea Company, both central to the slave trade. The college decided made a democratic decision that they would like to remove a memorial tablet in his name in the college chapel and place it elsewhere with suitable supplementary wording. This mobilized opposition and the diocesan court of Ely refused position, pr permission. Similar things have happened uh, in other colleges. Some college fellows strongly object to any kind of apology being made, arguing they were not there, it was centuries ago, we in contemporary Britain are not responsible for the deeds of our ancestors. Much has changed in the UK in these last years, but much has stayed the same. When we look across the world, we know we are living in very dark times. Haiti, so close by, Gaza, Ukraine, far-right populism, the threat to the planet. We cannot know how things are going to pan out. We must hold on to threads of hope and possibility. Creating new histories, inviting Britons to recognize hard truths is a modest act. But as James Baldwin stated so eloquently, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wall. Very engaging uh, lecture discussion. Um, so I want to open the floor to the question and answer section. Um, so I'd like to um, feel free to raise your hand. We have a passing mic. So I see a hand up already. I know we have those online. Um, and we will take questions online as well. So feel free to uh, enter the questions into the chat. All right. So I'm going to open the floor, uh, particularly for those online as in the room, please state your name um, and then get straight into your question. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Oshin Robinson. Um, I'll start I with... I have a warning. My hearing's not good, so if I don't catch everything you say, please allow Bexnell to... Okay, okay. No, no problem. Okay, but let's see. All right, um, I'll begin with one of your 
one of the last points you made about the the, the, the South Sea um, company. I, I personally don't think a lot of work has been done with in regards to looking at the South Sea bubble burst and its impact on the the explosion of slavery primarily in Jamaica with the Duke of Portland coming to Jamaica becoming governor inviting British subjects to migrate to Jamaica where when Portland was formed they were given land and food in order to settle the parish to as a means of defense against invasion and also the maroon, and also the maroon threat um, you made mention of um, compensation being given to Af some Africans based on evidence found of the cruelty meted out to them. We have the Thomas Thistlewood diary that details a lot of the, the challenges faced by the, by the Africans that he oversaw. We have the example of the Zong massacre and what it did for insurance claims globally. Plus, we also have um, the, the mortality rate for those that died along the Middle Passage as examples of harsh treatment meted out to the, 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 the persons that were captured in Africa and carried to the Caribbean. We also have the Thomas Harrison maps. There are copies of them here in Jamaica, but they are not that good. And with the database that you have, I think that with listing all the estates in Jamaica, it would be of substantial help primarily to researchers to use the, 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 the multiple maps collected by Thomas Harrison in the 1780s to add those surveyed maps to the information that you have on the, the website to, to, to help researchers. I was just reeling off the thoughts that came to me, but the question is, how can more information be garnered about the impact of the South Sea bubble burst on the explosion of slavery primarily in Jamaica? Thank you. Um, I've come back here because so that I speak with the microphone. Well, in fact, um, Cambridge University, Cambridge University had its own uh, investigation of histories of enslavement, along with, and the colleges have also done work. And one of the major findings is the huge involvement of the South Sea Company. So more and more evidence is becoming available. And in fact, the Cambridge research uh, will be, it's being written up now, and they are creating, uh, suppose, I think they are creating a web, uh, a web based, um, you know, facility, uh, which will include a lot of that information. So I think the thing is that there is so much happening, there is so much work being done, and we do now have a lot of researchers in Britain, but of course there are also, I mean, that's for the, that's for the UK archives, there are also all the people working in Africa, there are the people working in the US, and so on. So my feeling is that in this next decade, we're going to just have a much better mapping of the whole system of transatlantic slavery. You know, building from the database of the state of the voyages onto all the databases that are now being created, uh, the mapping work that is being done, and so on. So I think we're. In, I mean, I've been talking about the problems today, but I think there's also a huge amount of possibility and lots and lots of new work being made available in ways that are meant to be for public use, not just for scholars who publish large books, like the one I've just published. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much for the lecture. Um, good afternoon, well, evening, everyone. I'm Natalie Dietrich Jones, a research fellow at the Salesis at UWE. Drexner will repeat because I see you can, you're struggling a bit. A very simple question. Um, there were some implicit themes in your talk. Um, the 
connection between lack of records and what the presence of records can do for people. So your project on the legacies of slavery was able to shed light on how people benefited. But here in the Caribbean, we struggle with identity and not knowing who we are because records were not kept for certain people. So I was just wondering how important is knowing who you are and what can history do to possibly solve this issue of um, descendants of um, slaves not knowing where they come from. Well, interestingly, when we, when we finished the first tranche of work on compensation, uh, we were planning to uh, apply for a second lot of research funding and we consulted with a lot of people as to uh, a lot of descendants, Afro-Caribbeans in Britain, what research they really wanted. And they said they wanted work on the earlier period. They wanted us to go backwards uh, into the 18th century, which presented us actually with huge problems because none of us were 18th century historians. We had to become 18th century historians in order to do it. But it would have been easier for us to go on into the 19th century and go on documenting as you know, Nick Draper is so brilliant at doing, following the money. But instead, we followed the money and the property back. And of course, all that research is now part of what is on the database. And it is about the, um, I mean, it has been extensively used, as I said, by descendants uh, who have not always, I mean, many of whom had no idea that they were related in any way to uh, slave owners. In fact, my, my husband, Stuart, discovered through our database, through our work, that his, through his, on his mother's side, there is a slave owning connection in Portland. He had absolutely no idea, growing up in a brown middle class Kingston family, who had no apparent connection to, to that history, except in his mother's attitudes, actually, as he <laughs> <laughs> explains very well in his, in his memoir. Um, so, I'd say, but I would say, as I really have said today, that it, you know, that I think we have to address, we, the white people in Britain, have to address what we have to address, just as the descendants of the enslaved have to address what you have to address. And they're different problems. And obviously, there are lots of white historians who are working on the history of enslaved people and all of that. But in the current political situation, trying to get Britons to think about their past and feel responsibility for that past and know about that dark history, that's how I've interpreted um, the work that I've been doing for the last 20, 30 years, which this is simply one part of. So. You know, I read all the work on, on all the other things that are going on. There's fantastic work being done um, in the US, in the Caribbean, and so on, and in Britain. But a lot of the work now in Britain associated with race is on, it's on the contemporary, because people want to understand it to exactly to make the connections with now that I'm talking about. So all the work that's recovering black histories in Britain that's now being done, black history being taught in universities and so on and so forth, there's been an explosion of that work, which is not about, you know, it's not about, the, it's not about slavery, it's about the post-Windrush generations and all of that. Great. All right, I know we have a couple more questions in the room, but let me just uh, take a question from online. There's one question from Mervyn uh, Chisholm. What might be the most persuasive argument to get the British white community to take moral responsibility for slavery? Well, if I had a magic answer to that one, I would have put it in a cracker and given it to everybody for Christmas, you know? Pull the cracker, get the answer. I mean, it can only be, it's going to be layered and layered and layered and layered and layered, and it's not going to be a quick business. It can't be. 
but you know, I, I didn't begin to talk about any of the fiction that's been written. I mentioned the, the work of uh, visual artists, uh, the films that are being made, the music that's being made. I mean, this effort to rethink is going on at so many different levels, and that's what has to happen. It has to build and build, whether it's about, you know, fighting lots of people struggling inside the National Trust who believe the National Trust should go on doing this work. Lots of people all over the country having arguments about these issues. But the more arguments there are, the more debate there is. You know, when the, when the man, I read this piece on the History Reclaimed website last week, which of course is all about our work and so on, and having a go at us. And um, I thought to myself, no, you know, it's absolutely untrue that we have given up on being serious historians, evaluating, doing, debating, arguing, finding the evidence. That's what we do. That's absolutely what we do. We have a responsibility as historians to do the work properly. Otherwise, it's no good. You know, general statements about, as people are fond of making, Britain was built on slavery. It wasn't. Slavery was one of the elements in the building of Britain. And, you know, I haven't even mentioned white exploitation and class issues in Britain, which are absolutely crucial. Nor have I talked about gender discrimination and all, all of that. You know, there is so much to say, so much work to be done. But the cheerful bit is that lots is being done. The not such good bit is that we're under pressure. We are really under pressure. And you can't underestimate uh, the investment in these arguments, the political investment in these arguments. You wait. I mean, if any of you watch um, what goes on in UK politics, which is so utterly depressing, but, you know, there's now a new far-right party called Reform UK. Is it called? Reform UK. So right-wing historian, uh, right-wing conservatives are going off into Reform UK, which really is like a keep Britain white kind of organization, even though, of course, they will have donors who are Asian businessmen and, you know, they'll say they're inclusive, but actually what they're wanting to defend is a white benighted island, and that's what we're trying to unpick and to recognize the realities of an extremely cosmopolitan, thank goodness, island uh, as it is now. Right, we have quite a number of questions coming in online. I know some in the room. I'm just going to take one more online and then we're going to come back to the room. A uh, question from uh, Kiana Dixon. Um, how is Professor Hall's scholarship received by her white British colleagues, particularly on the call for reparations for slavery and colonialism? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd say that it's taken quite a while <laughs> to get um, recognition um, that, uh, you know, I mean, it was like a complete triumph when we got a big grant to do this, uh, to do the original work on compensation. And when the database was first published in 2014, not that much happened. There were quite a lot of, um, there were black critics as well as people who were really interested in it saying, you know, why are you focusing on all these individuals? What you need to do is work on the state. Well, of course, the state is absolutely crucial. But as I said, you know, compensation was a way in. It was a way in to say, look, you know, these people then, they got this money and that's what they did with it and they've built the environment that you live in i mean one of the i mean i was constantly discovering things like that lemington spa which i don't know whether anybody here has ever been to lemington spa but it's the most delightful regency place you know beautiful buildings etc cetera, etc cetera. what do i discover that a lot of the money that went into that building came from slavery. I mean, you find it all over the place. 
So the more we find, the more it's impossible to deny it. So, but the, but the denials and the disavowals go on because people don't want to know. So I'd say that the response of um, white historians has been mixed, just as the response of the public has been mixed. But I think it does matter that it's you know it's very difficult now that we have this pushback. It really is difficult, but it shows that we've had success. It shows that things have changed. And of course that matters terribly. It really does matter. Uh, hello, I'm Haley. I'm a UE student. I, I was just wondering if, you mentioned a few times the um, ignorance of white British people, especially on slavery and these things. Is there any historians doing work on why that is the case? Like how systematically they've been um, left out of this kind of information process? I mean, it's because of how history has been taught and how history has been organized in across schools and universities. So, um, you know, until very recently, the teaching of race in schools was all about US civil rights um, and South Africa and the struggle against apartheid. It wasn't at all about, I mean, the idea of the racialized presence in Britain was just not there. And this, of course, was to classes of kids who, in the big cities were increasingly actually very ethnically mixed, which is where the demand for um, a different syllabus comes up. But then, you know, quite some time ago, there was a reaction against the post-2007 the post new efforts to teach slavery in schools and a lot of new resources that were produced. And a new education secretary at that time, Michael Gove, insisted on a return to an old-fashioned kings and queens chronological history. I mean, it's, you know, it is a matter of you win some, you lose some, you hope you've won a bit more the next time, and so on. Now in the universities, um, one, of the, one of the claims that's being made by, uh, in the context of these uh, institutional reports that are being done, is that syllabuses must be addressed, that the syllabuses must be decolonized, but actually what the decolonizing of syllabuses means is such a mix, such a mix of things that people mean by that. And also, it's happening in a time of retrenchment. So, you know, you're arguing for new resources, for more money to be put into black histories, etc. Uh, at the very same time, um, history departments are being closed down in quite a number of the new universities. So, as I say, you know, it's it's a contestation that we have to keep on. So there are lots of people working in schools, in education, in uh, producing new materials, um, and doing their best uh, in difficult times. Hello. Um, I'll just quickly add something to the previous question that I'd recommend, if you're interested, the work of um, a colleague at University of Sussex, where I am based, um, called Professor Alan, um, oh my gosh, his surname's got Lester, sorry, suddenly went out my head, um, particularly a book called Deny and Disavow, which explains all of this, um, and the work of a teacher and PhD student at UCL called Abdul Mohammed, who who will give you some answers to that and is doing really important work. Um, sorry, I can't help <laughs> giving references. I'm a librarian. Um, and my question is about libraries and archives. Uh, but first, let me just say, as you know, I'm a big fan of your work. Thank you so much for a superb lecture and all the work you're doing in developing reparative anti-racist history. Um, and I'm interested in particular in the work you've developed with the, with the Legacies of British Slavery database and how you may have collaborated with 
librarians and archivists on that, and I'm sure you've spent a lot of time in libraries and archives in both the Caribbean and the UK. And just to build on a couple of the earlier questions about you know, the materials that are here that could be added to that work, um, the materials that are not available because of the erasure and um, non, you know, the epistemic violence of, of colonialism and slavery. What I'm getting at is what role in the reparations movement do you think institutions like UCL, like Oxford, like, like the, the rich universities of the UK have to play in, in economic and material reparations to libraries and archives in the Caribbean? So it's, it's brilliant having projects like yours and, and all the scholarship that's emerging in the UK and the US, and it's great that it's open access, but it is from there. And meanwhile, archives and libraries here are in a state of chronic underinvestment and crisis, and you know, there's the digital divide in what people can actually access online. I know this is a huge question, but I just wonder if, from your experience of working with powers that be in such institutions, you know, how can we call them to account on on actually investing in infrastructures here? And after all, UE was formed out of the University College London system. Well, to be honest, I think you know more about this than I do. <laughs> so, um, but I think, well, I don't think the omens are very good because we're living in such difficult times economically. And the universities are, you know, universities are in a state of crisis in Britain. Um, so the chances for serious investment elsewhere, I mean, of course, there will be some money which will come through government aid programs, etc., which they see as what they're doing. But I don't know, unless there's absolutely, unless, I mean, you know, I said, the, I made the point about um, Granville Sharp and Wilberforce, because what they did, I mean, not just them, I just used them as icons, you know, they, because they regarded slavery as a national sin, and it was essential that atonement should take place. A movement was built by, obviously, thousands of people demanding change. And eventually it happened in a compromised way, with compensation, with apprenticeship, with the continuation of unfree labor. Nevertheless, it was different from what had gone before. And it was because of a massive public movement in Britain at the end that pressure was put on the House of Commons, pressure was put at an election on whether MPs would say they supported abolition or not. And it was a key element in that election. Well, you know, can you imagine the election that's coming up in Britain in whenever it is, and a key question being, you know, national redemption? No, I can't. There has to be a movement, there has to be a powerful build-up uh, of what I'm talking about through, I mean, it's probably going to take, well, we don't want it to take too many generations because we may not be, I mean, I certainly won't be here, but, you know, I mean, there may be no planet also if people don't hurry up and do things, but it's, it's got to be a popular movement. That's the only way that uh, the government policies will, will significantly change. We all know in Britain that the Tories have done such dastardly things that they are leaving. They know they're going to lose the election. They know that Labour will come in and will, there will be no money to do anything. I mean, it's tragic. It's going to be, we're all going to be absolutely in a total rage and despair, but that's what's going to happen. So, public, public opinion in the end is what can move mountains. Um, it did in the US. Uh, we have to see. I have to say one other thing because I remembered, which I should have said before, when I hope the person hasn't gone, I think she has, who asked about, no, it was over here, who asked about um, descendants. Oh, yeah. Well, what I should have said is that uh, um, the center at UCL now, the work that they're now doing, led by Matthew Smith, who is now the director, who is of course Jamaican and has a profound commitment to Jamaica, is on enslavement in Jamaica and building more resources uh, on that front. And we're actually, 
we have started on the process of, uh, we have a partnership with uh, not entirely desirable but necessary partners, um, what are they called, Ancestry.com, uh, to digitise all the registers of enslaved people uh, across the Caribbean, which is actually a huge, it's going to be a huge resource for people working here. Uh, as well as in many other places. That's a very, very important project that has now begun at the National Archives that are in the process of digitising. So that's something to look forward to. Lots of new res resources, free and online. Hope. <laughs> uh, Professor Hall, my name is Suzanne Francis-Brown. Um, I'm a, a great supporter of, of the Legacies project. And, um, I, <laughs> and I really wanted to say that I think your point about the importance of having that information um, and some of the, the things that it has disrupted is actually, in fact, some of the reason for some of the pushback that, that you are getting. I think you're 100% right. I was going to ask about next steps so that you could talk a little bit about that. You just firsted me on that. But one of the things I think we're also missing, and it's something I keep thinking about often, is that those registers that you are, the, the center is going to be making more widely available cover the period 1817 to 1832. That's, that's a fairly small portion of the period of enslavement, and there are all those years before that for which there is a literal chasm in terms of persons' efforts to find out who they are. One of the things that I think really can help is finding more of those horrendous ledgers in which people are recorded and there are so few that have come to light and I wonder whether that is something that there is a way to to sort of build some momentum behind identifying them bringing them to light digitizing them and making them more available so Well, I think I mean, that's a very, very helpful contribution and of course you're absolutely right. And I suppose again there's a bit of hope in the way that um, documents are turning up that we had no idea about. You know, for example, I mean Alex Renton's book, that entire archive was in his family for centuries. and. I mean, it, of all the books like that, that's the one that I like best because I think he's been most profoundly affected by the work that he's done and what it's meant to him. But, you know, I think there are probably a lot of materials still held privately that may get increasingly, people may feel more able to get them out and give them rather than keep them hidden. Um, and of course, I mean, the university is opening up. That's, I mean, it's not what you're talking about. What you're talking about are the listings and the ledgers that are for the period before, for the 18th century, basically. Um, but it is encouraging what suddenly people find. So I have... Uh a uh, dual question and it well I'm Nicole Plummer from the Institute of Caribbean Studies so Brittany is said to be in a recession or is for a number of years and have you found that the reactions to your work is informed or dictated by economic imperatives including the reaction to humanities in general so that was my question well you know, there is a very, um, uh, Britain's not a very uh, optimistic place to live now. There is a powerful um, sense of decline, um, which is obviously post-imperial and all of that, but it's got much worse, much worse as, um, all the institutions 
of welfare, education, health, prisons, on and on and on. They're all in a very bad way and all need really serious investment because ever since the triumph of neoliberalism, you know, everything has been left to the market and it's been catastrophic for public services. So the attack on the humanities is all part of the, the same, I mean, what I'm talking about in terms of the culture wars, that critical thinking, it's not as bad as in the States where, you know, states are literally decreeing that, that critical race theory must not be taught and so on. It's not happening like that. On the other hand, the uh, closure of arts and humanities departments in what are basically the new universities, which are the poorer universities, and what has happened in the last uh, years is that the rich universities have just swallowed up, they've sucked up more and more students because students are essential in a time when government grants have been greatly reduced. So student fees are absolutely crucial. And that allows, that leaves the weaker universities in a very parlous state. And then what they do is they close the humanities because you know, students, I think you're quite familiar with these problems here, students choose to do subjects which they hope will get them jobs. So they want to do business studies, they want to do management, they want to do computers and IT, etc, etc, etc. So the STEM subjects, which are also what the government's supporting, because they don't like the humanities anyway, for political reasons, it's all totally interconnected. But it makes for a difficult situation from, you know, from the libraries onwards, actually, at, at every kind of level. Okay, great. Um, there's great interest. We have a few more questions. I'm um, gonna. Very tired. Yes, I know. Well, okay. So, uh, okay. One more question. Last question. <laughs> How about Abi? Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Henry. I teach in the United States, um, and I'm curious about the tension between, on the one hand, the ideological imperatives that shape the stories we tell about violent histories when our outcome, our hoped for outcome is to appeal to benevolent white people. And on the other hand, the urgency of attending to the violence of these pasts and transforming their lingering conditions. So the question is, how does one tell a truthful story about the violence of slavery that white people will listen to? And is the sanctity of the historical narrative's truth in its articulation of violence worth potentially alienating some pe white people? Okay. only by going on telling. So, you know, interestingly, okay, I'll give you, um, Alice, who's in the audience, mentioned uh, Alan Lester's book, um, uh, Disavowal and Denial, or Denial and Disavowal, whichever way, right, Deny and Disavowal, which is a very excellent book, and it's written for uh, an, a general audience. It's not a heavy, great, heavy scholarly term. But then I also wanted to mention um, some of the fiction. And quite recently, Zadie Smith, who is a very, very popular author, um, mixed race, grew up in northwest London, uh, and she's now written her slavery novel. And so, I mean, clearly, it's interesting. She's never, she's written about race plenty of times before, but she hasn't written about the history before. And now she has. And so her book, which is called The Fraud, I mean, it will have major sales because of who she is. And so those are interventions that make a different kind of difference. And different audiences have access to them. And then there's the great television series that Steve McQueen made, um, is that called Small Axe? Yeah. 
everybody calls good things small acts, but anyway, um, there were six terrific programs which again got big audiences telling a black history. And so it goes on. So there is more. There's just a row going on now because there's a new um, black play come from the US, which is now going to be on in London. And they've said that they're going to have some black only performances, which Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, has seen fit to investigate and say that, you know, this is improper and this shouldn't happen. But these are all ways in which these questions are coming to the surface. The National Portrait Gallery, where my colleague Libby, who I have to say thank you for the PowerPoint, because she did it and she does them so beautifully. So the National Portrait Gallery has been investigating its past. New exhibitions that bring these subjects into focus for, again, a different audience. So people are being... You could say that people are being assailed on all sides. What they're making of it is another matter. Whether it's what extent it's changing opinions, we can't really tell. But we all have to keep doing our work. That's what we have to do. And we have to hope that over time, uh, the truths will out, that they will out, and people will understand that there is a dark history which has to be recognized. I think that's my final word. Yes. <laughs> All right. Without further ado, graduate student Okeen Rankin will give the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful evening to you all. It is with great pleasure I present the vote of thanks for one of the university's most revered events, this the 39th annual Elsa Govaya Memorial Lecture. Firstly, I would like to thank our speaker, Professor Catherine All, for presenting an informative yet thought-provoking lecture. On behalf of the Department of History and Archaeology, I am extending gratitude to the following persons and entities. Pro Vice Chancellor, Ms. Sandra Maynard, who is here on behalf of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, the offices of the University Bursar and the Campus Bursary for their support in financing this event. Our Dean, Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, who provided the greetings on the night. Yes. Professor Kathleen Monteet, who, who introduced our speaker. The industrious yet dynamic duo of Mrs. Claudine Walker Robinson and Mrs. Camilla Clark Brown, who worked diligently in ensuring that today's proceedings ran smoothly. <laughs> Thank you to the ever present yet ever reliable archaeologist technologist Mr. Clive Gray and our host of lectures Dr. Dexnell Peters thank you for moderating the question and answer sections special thanks to Dr. Carl Watts and Dr. Renee Nelson for assisting with the preparation of the venue and of course the moderation of the online forum I'm also thanking Ms. Patrice Clark and her team of students from the Department of History and Archaeology, Explorers, formerly the History and Archaeology Society, who served as our ushers for the evening. Thanks is also extended to the staff from the faculty office and those from the regional office who worked in tandem with us to secure the venue. Gratitude is extended to staff from MITS that ensure that the technical side of things from the microphones to the speakers work perfectly. To Ms. Sutherland and her team of caterers who will be providing refreshment in a short while, which of course I, I will be looking forward to. Thank you in advance. <laughs> Thank you to the students from our varying graduate and undergraduate programs for being here today. And finally, but most important, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here.
course, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this prestigious event. Have a wonderful rest of the evening.